When I turned 50, I thought I should capture some of the stories of my life for my children. I began compiling essays and stuff that I'd written in the past and looking at that and seeing what there was that could be turned into a book. So this is Nothing Bad Ever Happens Here and it's a memoir. I don't feel like I really chose to write the memoir. It chose to be written. So I kind of got stuck with having to face myself and I didn't want to do that. When do we ever want to do that? It just kept coming at me. I remember once sitting down in a cafe ordering a tea and there was a napkin left over from the last person that for whatever reason hadn't been cleared off the table and I turned it over and it just said, write your story. Dad borrowed Hemingway's The Old Man and the Sea from the library for me when I was six years old. It fired my imagination and broke my heart. I'd never read a book without a happy ending. Sitting beside my dad on the patterned vinyl sofa, I discover what grief feels like at close hand in someone I love. It's a wound that breaks open again and again. You did mention an early tragedy in your life. Would you be comfortable telling us what happened? Um, when I was 12, my brother Byron drowned in a boating accident with my grandfather. It destroyed my family. My parents never got over it. Their marriage ended. For a long time, his name was never spoken in our family. In fact, if it was spoken, it caused such extreme pain to my parents that it became evident that we simply couldn't speak about it. That experience, I think, settled into the heart of my creative life. And if I go back through my books, I can see the effect that that event had on my writing from that point on and continues to have on my writing. I think one of the hardest things about writing a memoir is that you can't avoid writing about other people. I wrote it knowing that there would be disagreement in my family, being very concerned about how my parents would feel that history had been portrayed. I was probably most worried about my dad. Before I gave it to him, I had a conversation with him and I was really worried that somehow or other this would cause a, a schism in our relationship. I did not know the starting point of her writing that work, but she did come here, here one day and she was quite distraught and we had a big hug and I said to her, look, it's OK, it'll be OK. I think she's done a marvellous job with it. She writes beautifully, of course. Has your mother read it? I've offered it to her and I haven't heard back from her and I'm not sure how she'll go with it. I think it'll be hard for her. No, it hasn't been offered to me. I didn't even know it was... I mean, I knew it was printed. Mm. Yeah. No. Are you excited to read it? Excited? Oh, no, I'm just interested to read it, like I have with all her books. There's a moment where you can choose to not write as honestly and fully in your career because your parents are still alive. Or sometimes maybe it's necessary to be brave. It depends how much of other people's lives you're prepared to put out in print. That's the thing. It would feel terrible to wait around to finish a book because I was waiting for my parents to not be here anymore. I'd much rather they were here and we were able to have these fantastic conversations. My parents are not OK. My father is utterly bereft and my mother is an abyss of pain. I hear her say to my father one night, not long after the funeral, he wouldn't have died if you had loved him more. He was about three weeks short of being 16 years of age. To this day, we're all damaged by the subsequent, event, uh, you know, years and days of that tragic event. He never stops loving our mother. When I lament her absence, he always gives me the same advice. Never forget, Heather, she had one terrible day, your mother. Well, mistakes were made, obviously. Mistakes were made. I think the weather came up and caught them and they were only in a small boat. 
And for once, my son did, didn't have his life jacket on and I found it on his bed later and realised that he'd rushed off and forgotten it. But it was the cold that killed them. But I, it's a, I can't really talk about it. My mother lost her father and her son, the two people she loved most in all the world. My father lost his son and his wife. My siblings and I lost our brother, our grandfather and our family. There is a void at the heart of our home that nothing can repair. We do not talk about Grandad. No one talks about grief at all. No one in my family ever mentions Byron's name. It was hard having that name live inside me and not be able to acknowledge him somehow. So when I was pregnant with my second son, I thought maybe if he was a boy, I could call him Byron. At seven and a half months pregnant, I began feeling unwell. I woke up in the morning and I went down and ran a bath and I looked down into the water and it filled with blood. If you have a placental abruption, it's very rare for the baby, let alone the mother, to survive. I was taken to a hospital in Melbourne and had an emergency caesarean and this tiny little baby born six weeks early nearly drowned in the placental fluid, but you didn't drown. You're the Byron that didn't drown. I remember being asked what I thought about naming you Byron. You're the Byron that lived, <laughs> and you're the Byron that's brought that name back into our family and had it mean so much that is joyful and beautiful and creative. It was okay. As you know, that you and I are OK for the same reason. It's all born of love. I know he'd be so proud that you carry his name. I thought about it, but I thought, no, it's not for me to say. And I think it's lovely that you've been called Byron and it suits you. I think I should emphasise the fact we all needed Heather to write the work that she's written for us. We need art and we need it in in big scoops as far as I'm concerned. I could write a memoir about travelling, the writing life, or my love of baking cakes, but I'm still that girl who wants to get to the big conversation, to the heart of things. So here are some stories about life and death, about experiences that have no easy explanation, but which happen nevertheless. Life is a process of forgiveness for the choices we make in order to be ourselves.